But what are these five pillars? Four at the gate, five here at the tabernacle, and this is where it really gets good. So notice, remember again, these pillars upholding that, is upholding that veil of fine twined linen going into the holy place. I want you to notice, five pillars support hope up. Five pillars hold up, etc. But notice, we looked at the beginning, we looked at the gospel. But don't you know the book of Isaiah is the pre-gospel? Don't miss it. We got the pre-gospel and we have the, the gospel. And don't you know, Isaiah reveals to us the five pillars. Don't miss it. Isaiah reveals to us the five pillars. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And who is that? No other than Jesus Christ himself. And the government and the empire in the original Hebrew and the empire shall be upon what? His shoulders. In other words, you can kind of picture in your mind that Jesus Christ in this, in this depiction that, that, that Isaiah has given, him, given us that he himself is a what? A pillar. That he himself is holding everything up. Because his whole empire, his whole kingdom depends on him. It's on his shoulders. But you know what? God gives us names. He gives us names. And just think about it. It's on his shoulders and then he gives us pillars. Here it is. He called it. And it's upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The what? Prince of Peace. I hope you catch this. So what are the five pillars? What are the five pillars? So what are the five pillars? Now Jesus is a support, support pillars with five names that define the, his character and his work. And we see this here in Isaiah. He says, each pillar are the five names of Jesus that uphold the empire, the kingdom of God, and the plan of salvation. And it says it very clearly in the pre-gospel, it gave us five pillars. The first pillar is what? Wonderful. The second pillar is what? Counselor. The third pillar is what? The mighty God. The fourth pillar? The everlasting Father. And the Prince of Peace. There you go right there. So when you, when you enter into the holy place, God is telling you right there in your mind as you, as a priest of God now, as a, as royalty to God, going through the blue, the scarlet, and the purple. God is saying, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. Isn't that good? And as we walk through the five pillars now, knowing and understanding the power of God, knowing and understanding his whole purpose and meaning, we walk into the golden room. So now let's walk into the golden room. A room full of gold. Matter of fact, they had so much gold throughout the whole sanctuary in the wilderness. They did a tally to find out how much this stuff is worth in today's money. Don't you know it's worth over $87 million. That's how much gold they had. They had gold all throughout. And you walk into this room, it's just, it's all, oh, it's just nothing but gold all around you. You're looking at golden tables, golden candle, you look at the altar, and you look at the golden walls all around you. It was beautiful. It was, it was breathtaking. Because now we now are in the sanctification experience. And we find here in Exodus, Exodus 26, 15 to 30. We find here that there's these, the, the, the walls were basically 48 board panels. They were 15 by 27 inches. They're made of shittim wood, overlaid with gold. That made up the walls of the temples. Matter of fact, on one side, on the north side, there were 20 walls. So 20 panels upright on the north side. And 20 panels on the south side. And 6 panels on the west side. With 2 corner panels. And what these walls represent, I can't, don't have time to get deep, deep into it. But it basically represents, you know, what's the purpose of walls? The walls are for what? Protection. So once we enter sanctification experience, we don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about the things of this world, the cares of this life, because God, he is our protection. Jesus is our protection from the enemy when we're inside. Notice, we're in, inside. When we're inside the boundaries of sanctification. 
We got to be where? Inside. Inside. Those walls represent the protection. Now what does the gold in the sanctuary represent? Now this is general because there are many things in the sanctuary that was made of gold. But since the, since the, the walls in the holy place have so much gold in it, we might as well bring it out right now. What does the gold, the gold room? Let's see in Job, Job 22, 5 to see what does the gold represent? Job 22, 5 tells us, Yea, the Almighty, who's the Almighty? God shall be thy defense. And in Hebrew, defense in this particular context literally means gold. If you actually look at other, other translations, they actually say gold. So, ye, yea, the Almighty shall be thy gold, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. So who does gold represent here? The Almighty God. Gold, the almighty God, Jesus Christ himself. So we are literally experienced. Remember God said, I want to dwell with you. So now you are actually in the sanctification process, dwelling with God. But the victory ain't complete yet. It ain't done yet. He ain't finished with you yet. Now Isaiah 13, 12, it says, I, the almighty God, I will make a more, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. And that's where they had a lot of gold in that place. And God says, once you step into the golden room, now I want, you, you went through justification, praise the Lord, that was good, that was good, that was good, but now I want to make you holy. So now you're walking into the golden room, the holy place. For holy people. And God says, I want to make you like what? Gold. Didn't he say that? Like gold. Now how does he do it? 1 Peter 4, 12-13. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the what? Fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But what? What do you do? You need to rejoice. Praise the Lord for this trial. Why do I rejoice? But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of God's suffering, or Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Because you're in the golden room now. The Lord is refining you with a fire. And he wants you to look just like the golden walls as you continue to go through the process. And hey, I can't, I can't just let everything out because God gives you the power to do that. Know where he gives you that power? He gives you at that. You know, you look to the right, you're going to see some bread there. You look to the left, you're going to see some candlesticks there. You look straight ahead, you're going to see an altar and incense there. And all that will give you the power to become gold like God himself, like Jesus himself. So we see here the gold also represents our characters that reflect the holy and perfect character of the almighty God, Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that good? It, I don't know about you. I, I don't care if I'm preaching to myself. It's good. <laughs> it's good. You look at the, all the other furnishing and then you, you dazzle. Then you kind of look up. And you're like, wow. And what do you see? You see... You see fine twine linen again. Remember you saw fine twine linen at the gate? You saw fine twine linen when you, of purple, of blue, and of scarlet. And you see it again. You say, wow. And then you see, man, they got some beautiful embroiled, embroiled embroidery of angels sewn into that tapestry. Oh, how beautiful did it look. So you see a covering. You see a covering. But God has some symbology here because he didn't just put one piece of covering up there. He put four coverings up there. Don't miss it. Now Psalms 91.4. Let's turn there real quick. Psalms 91.4. We're getting somewhere. Psalms 91.4. Psalms 91.4. Because the question is, are you covered? Man, that's a sermon in itself. Are you covered? Are you covered? Are you covered? And this is what Jesus, he gives, he gives us an illustration here of a covering. So let's learn some more about the covering in general, he shall cover thee with his what? Feathers. Under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and what? Buckler. And we, we see that feathers are actually the skin of birds. They keep out the, you know, they keep out the, the, the rain and all this, the water and all those things. So God is saying, I am your covering like feathers of a bird. Let's go to Psalms 140, verse 7. Psalms 140, verse 7. O God, the Lord... 
the strength of my salvation. Thou has what? Covered my head in the day of battle. God said, I got you covered. I got you covered. Psalms 61.4. He said, I got you what? Covered. Got you covered. I will abide in a tabernacle. Where? Where, where, now, where are you walking? You walk into the tabernacle experience. You walk into the sanctification experience. Where are you at now? You are in the what? Tabernacle. In the holy place of the tabernacle. And God says it here. And I will abide. I'm right there. I would abide in a tabernacle forever. I will trust in the convert of thy wings. And that literally means convert. Means covering. <laughs> Don't miss it. So you are covered. You are covered. But again, when you look up, you see that ceiling. And this is where I got to bring up my... <clears throat> and you find this in uh, Exodus. You, if you want to, you can write it down. You find this in Exodus chapter 26, verses 1 through 6. As you look up at the ceiling. And when you look up at the ceiling, as we mentioned before, we already understand what the blue, the purple, the scarlet, it all means the same thing. Nothing has changed there. But you find there, you find panels. You find, he said, make fine twine linen. Six feet by 42 feet. And what you're going to do, you're going to make ten of them. Just make this ten. Ten, ten panel, ten um, pieces of curtain. And what you're going to do is you're going to tie these together. Gonna be ten of them. Okay, just pretend I'm tying it together. All right, tie them together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna get to a point in a little bit. Then he says, I want you to make five more. Okay, to cover. So you have a section here. This is section number one, and right here is gonna be section number two. And this is all the fine twine linen with the, the with the embroidered angels in it. Beautiful. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And these are all together. Don't miss this there. Here we go. We're getting some. All these are going to be coming together too. Tie them all together too. So you have two. So when you look up, you're going to look up, just look at the ceiling. You're going to have two sets of five going across just like that. Six by 42 feet going all the way across just like that but there's something interesting as I as I was reading that I said yeah yeah glory we understand what the blue represents we know that's the the standard of God we in, in the law of God we do understand the, the the red the scarlet represents the blood of Christ we we've learned that already we we understand what the purple represents the royalty yeah I see all that Lord but there's something interesting I do see because you, what you've done is you said what I want you to do Moses I want you to take some a blue twist like 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 tassel that's braided and once you what you do I want you to make 50 loops now this is I'm not don't laugh at my drawing <laughs> I was trying, just trying to get to the point here 50 loops here and then it's gonna be on the edge of that first panel the first section there is gonna be on the edge there and then he said I want you to put 50 loops right here but I don't want any color. I want it to be blue. Want it to be what? Blue. Now, now can anybody tell me what, what does blue represent? When we go through the, it represents what? The commandments, right? Represents the holiness of God. The commandments of God. The standards of God. And God said, when you look up, not only do you see the blue throughout the fine twine linen, but you notice something. You see that, 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 that ribbon. You see that twist. And it should take you back and connect you because, let's go back now. Let's go to Numbers. Let's go to Book of Numbers real quick. Yeah, this is interesting. Interesting. The Book of Numbers. Let's go Book of Numbers, verse chapter 15, 37. Because remember, God has things so we can continue to remember. We are so forgetful as human beings. We forget. So much. We forget where we put our keys. We forget where we put our cell phone. And we forget the law of God. And God said, don't forget. Just like he says in Psalms 1 and 3. Don't forget all my benefits. Because I'm telling you this, so you won't forget, so you can be blessed. Let's look at this in, 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 in Numbers 15. <clears throat> this is interesting. Because he had him to put this blue twist inside the, the ceiling. A 
that connection should continually be in the priest's mind. The connection should be in the people's mind. Because in Numbers 15, 37, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 38, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they may take them fringes on the borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they may put on the fringes of the borders of their garments a rib band of blue. And what you notice, and when you go to the original Hebrew, the fringes are literally twist. The same type of twist that you find in the tent ceiling. And he says, I want you to put it at the, at the bottom of your garments. Why? Verse 39 makes it very clear. Why does he do this? We know the blue represents the commandments of God. God is saying, don't forget. What does he, he say in verse 39? And, she, and, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it. And remember that all the commandments of the Lord. And what? Do them. And they that seek not after their own heart and their own eyes. After which ye use to go a whoring. That ye may remember. And what? Do all my commandments. And be what? Holy unto God. Remember we're in the holy room now. We're in the holy place. And God's reminding. Be ye holy. As God in heaven is holy. He's reminding us the commandments of God. That is a standard. He's reminding us of that. And then he said in verse 41, he says, I am the Lord thy God which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God and I am the Lord your God. So they had to walk around with a twist of blue on the fringes, on the borders of their garments. So we see here in that fine twine linen, God places the same twist of blue in the fine twine linen. So we could be reminded again. The covering. Remember, we looked at the ceiling right here. That's the first thing you see when you look up. That fine twine linen with that blue ribbon around it. Twist around. But then let's go ahead and, and, and start from the top. And then we're going to work our way down. There's four coverings. There's four what? Coverings, And I can go over that because remember we talked about the four gospels and then God gives us the four coverings. Just like he gives us the four horns. God has a purpose for all that now. And it all points us back to the four gospels. Don't forget that. Alright, badger skin. God made us badger skin. You, took, you see there, the Bible reveals that the first covering is badger skin. Animal skin. And notice, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. That badger skin was what? Flesh. The Bible says in Romans 1.3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In, ver in John 1.14 it says the word was made flesh. Made what? Flesh. He was made badger skin. <laughs> he was made skin. God became skin and bones. Flesh. The blood. All that. God came. The word was made flesh. And what did he do? Dwelt among us. And we became his glory. The glory of the only begotten father. Full of grace and truth. And then we skip on over. To Hebrews. I hope you're catching this now. The Hebrews. Make sure it's there. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as ye are children. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and the blood. Of the what? Flesh and the blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He's revealing I became flesh. I became human. I'm human but I'm divine. To save you. That's the first covering. So we see here is God is, God, he, he humbled himself as divine, as God, and became flesh. We see here in Philippians 2, 5, you go to Philippians 2, 5 through 8, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But what did he do? He made himself no reputation and took upon him the form of a serpent and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled, he what? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So we see that outer, that first, the first thing, that the outer part of that tabernacle, the badger skin, 
It represents the, human, the humanity, the humility, and the protection of Jesus Christ who came to save man from sin. Remember, God was giving Israel a prophecy throughout the whole sanctuary service. Jesus hasn't come yet. So he's teaching them, I am going to come in the flesh to dwell among you. So first we have this badger skin. And then underneath the badger skin you find in Exodus 26, 14, he says, I want you to make ram skin and I want you to dye it red. What? Get some ram skin and then dye it red. Why are you doing that, Lord? Why? Because he's pointing his back. See, one thing you have to understand. When they had certain offerings in the sanctuary service, there were certain offerings such as the wave offering, the trespass offering, and some other offerings. They all used the ram. And the ram, of course, pointed to who? Jesus Christ. God told Abraham to put his son on the altar of sacrifice. And then Abraham went to kill his only begotten son, the only one to the heir of the promise. And as he went to, to actually sacrifice his son, an angel stopped his hand. And then he looked, and over there he saw a, a ram in the bush. <laughs> And that ram, of course, pointed to who? Jesus Christ, who spilled his blood. His blood cleanses. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. None. God is reminding, I am the ram. I am the only begotten. Look to me as a ram. A ram is a male sheep. And Jesus is the one that take away the sins of the world. He is that ram. So when I look, go for the badger skin, I understand he's a flesh. Then I go to the next level and understand that Jesus, the ram, he died for my sin, covered me with his blood. Awesome. So the second covering, that ram skin dyed red, represents Jesus and his blood that was shed to cleanse from sin. But then we notice that third layer, gold hair. And it's believed that his gold hair was white. Now, everybody can know what that represents, right? What does that represent? Purity. Amen. The purity made white. But it's interesting. It's interesting. Why did they use a goat? Every day, there were sacrifices in the outer court. Every day, there was a, there was a symbolic transfer to the, from your, your, of your sins from the outer court into the holy place. But once a year... There was a service called the Day of Atonement or the Day at One Mint. And what they do, they took two goats. Two goats. How many goats? Two goats. And one goat was chosen to be a scapegoat to represent Satan who is going to take, who is going to ultimately in the end take all sin upon him. And then the other goat represented who? Jesus Christ. And it's he, only he that cleanses us totally from all sin. He has washed us and made us what? White as snow. Isn't that something? You're learning all this in the sanctuary. It's illustrated right here. And this is what the children of Israel constantly had in front of their mind. The Savior. The Savior. Jesus. The Messiah is coming. Jesus in the cloud. Jesus in the, in the gold. Jesus in the brass. Jesus all throughout the sanctuary. So the third covering represents what? Purity. Purification. And holiness. In the sanctuary. Because again, recognize you are in the sanctification process. And you're looking up. And sanctification is all around you. Perfection is all around you. And it's interesting because I, I like this text here. Kinda, it kind of wraps things up when it comes to the, three, the four coverings. In Ezekiel 16.10, he, he gives us a, 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 a picture. A picture in our mind. To kind of describe what you see in this tabernacle. What you see in the covering. He gives a picture and he says, and this is what Jesus, God says. He says, I clothe thee also with the broidered work. That's that outer linen. He said, I clothe thee with that. And shod you with what? Badger skin. And I girded about with fine linen. And I covered thee with silk. That's what God wants to do. Totally cover you. Taking you back to the sanctuary message. Wrapping it up right here. There are four phases of the ministry of Jesus Christ that's representing the four coverings of the tabernacle. I hope you saw it. I hope you follow that four-phase ministry of Christ just in the four coverings. First, you have the badger skin. We see that Jesus, he did what? Humbled himself and became human to save us. 
Then we see that ram skin dyed red. We see that that's the sacrifice of our Savior. The sacrificial Savior who died and bled for the sins of the whole world. And then we see that purity. That white. That goat white hair. That's the sinless, perfect, holy Savior without any blemish. Jesus Christ. That was he did. That's what he did for us. He was perfect. And then we see that royal covering. The intercealing. The exalted Savior in blue. The standard of God. The red blood. The purple. The king of king and the lords of lords. But don't you notice? I want you to notice something else. You also see the four phase salvation for us. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Because when you look at the badger skin, it will recognize that you need to humble yourself. Pride has to go away. You have to humble yourself at the feet of Jesus. Then you, then you, as you see the ram skin dyed red, that's covered, you are now covered by the cleansing blood of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are now made blameless. You see it right there. And then as you're made blameless, and Jesus said, my blood will make you what? White as snow. You see that? That goat hair. You're now walking in purity and a holiness of God. You are now walking in sanctification, which is a process of a lifetime. But you're walking in the process of sanctification to become totally holy. And now, as you go down to that last layer, that fine twine linen, that royalty of purple and, and blue and scarlet, you are now what? the sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, the Lord wanted to paint this picture in your mind of the sanctuary so you can clearly understand what he's doing for you. So you can clearly understand that process of salvation. So you can clearly understand the victory over sin in the sanctuary. Do you see it? Have you gone through the justification? Have you literally placed, when you first walked into the gate, have you placed your all on the altar of sacrifice? Have you had that exchange with God? Because God already did what he's supposed to do. He already died once for man's sin. But have you exchanged and said, Lord, I give it up all. And then have you gone to the labor? Have you washed your hands and have you washed your feet? And as you go to the temple, and you see the name of God in the pillars. Wonderful. Counselor. The Almighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. As you go through there. Are you ready to be, are you ready to be made holy? 